भद्रम कर्णे शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येक्षिजत्रुष्टुवागुंसनु व्यशेम देवित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्वेदा स्वस्ति नस्ताक्षो अरिष्टने स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओ शातिशा हरि ओ Dear friends, we have been repeating our study of the Mundaka Upanishad. We had completed revision of the first Mundaka. The essence of the teachings of the first Mundaka was in two different chapters: how a person. very successful in this world but was introspective in habit he always wanted to find out what is real what is unreal what is everlasting what is transitory though he was a highly accomplished person wealthy well placed in the society of an outstanding reputation and all that in one single word in sanskrit it is said he was a mahashala a man of great achievements but he was introspective in nature because of that introspection he thought that all the effort that i am putting in to achieve by objects of desire in this world that effort that i put in is not commensurate with the results that i get back why the fault of that result that i get back is not eternally permanent it is transitory i put in so much of effort and i get transitory things in return if i put in such an amount of effort is there anything by means of which i get something which is everlasting and eternal why did this come to his mind because at that time society this was a talk of the town not as of today politics and share market and stock market in those days this was the going discussion in the town places and in the plazas in the market places this is what was going on he must have heard that there is something known as the eternal the real the permanent ever existing so with this question in mind he goes and asks a teacher a rishi who has gone through this process and achieved that goal rishi rigdrashta sarvavet that is he sarvaveta that we see those everything he has demystified the mystery of this universe Ongi Rasha by name who lived next to the habitation in the forest. He goes and asks him, and he immediately, seeing the sincerity, the devotion, the dedication to know, to understand, to realize, in that highly accomplished, successful man. Rishi agreed to teach him. Before he starts, we find the Upanishad tells us that, my dears, 
this wisdom that we are going to explain to you, it is not a human brain wave. It has not emanated from human wisdom. Why? However well educated, well cultured, well enlightened a human may be, but humans have their faults and failures. Therefore, it has to come from some source which is undeniably correct and perfect. So the first shloka we find that the Upanishad teaches us this wisdom that Maharishi Angiracha is to teach to Mahashala Shonaka has emanated from the Divine itself. From the Divine it came to the human because a human who achieved that divinity, he was passed on that wisdom. And that wisdom has come down from generation to generation up till now today we are all studying the Upanishads. This is how it starts. And he says, there are two ways of learning, the worldly and the spiritual. The first Mundaka with its two chapters have discussed that. And the end result is, remember that shloka, Pariksha Lokan Karma Chitana Brahmano Nirveda Mayat Nasti Akrita Kritena. Probably the twelfth or the eleventh shloka of the second chapter. Tat Vigyanartham Sa Guru Me Babi Gachet Samitapani Sotriam Brahmanishtam Guru. This is how it starts. That having seen through, what did he see through? That I am performing all the yagas, yakyas, brata, parayana, and etc., 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 to the best of my ability, collecting all that I can collect and arrange and I perform, I organize. What I get in return? A longish period in the heaven. And when my bank balance comes to zero, I come back to the world again. So my hard work is not commensurate with the result. The result is also transitory. And the eternal law, the infallible law is infinite can be cannot be acquired by finite activity. Finite activity will give you finite result. But I am prepared to work hard to get something which is infinite, everlasting, permanent. This is what he says. And he says, though I am well qualified, though I am well informed, though I have achieved all that has to be achieved, but this is a subject where I cannot venture all by myself, depending on my uh, intellect depending on my experience and wisdom and my intellect. It is beyond me. So he humbles himself, he becomes modest, and with all humility, modesty, devotion and dedication, duly supported with rock-solid determination to achieve, he goes to a guru in a manner where his very approach impresses the teacher that he is humble, he is modest. Why? Humility and modesty are sure signs of capacity known as 
receptivity, assimilation, absorption. So teachers look around that. Is he humble? Is he modest? If so, he will be receptive, assimilative, absorbent. That is the right field to sow your seed to reap a wonderful harvest. So he goes with this attitude. And in the last shloka of the second chapter of the first Mundaka, a guru, the teacher, has been told that if he finds ever such a student, he has no right to withhold his experience and his wisdom. His experience has his wisdom, which he says he has earned by his sweat of his brow, but it happened because God ordained it. That is how he came to know the reality behind the apparent world. It is not his own property. He is a keeper of this wisdom to be passed on to other generation. And that is how, through this system of handing over wisdom from generation to generation, it is available to us here today. So, to sum up, dear, the first Mundaka has covered all that. The second Mundaka starts, and I started the first Loka, Tadeta Satyam. This is true. Why true? Because I have not gone beyond this Vyavharik Mitya, that is, this Jagrata Avastha, Jagrata Avastha, wakeful state. He says, now what I am going to tell you is reality now. Follow me slowly, carefully, step by step, I will take you there. Before I go there, the example that he gives here, previously he has given an example of a spider. He has given an example of Mother Earth. He has given an example of a human body. Urnanabi, a spider, without depending on anybody, spins a web from his own body. And he absorbs it. It comes up out of it, it goes back into it. No second element is required. This is the example. The second example is the word, Mother Earth. Uncared for, thousands and thousands of different herbs and plants and etc. etc. Botanical life comes out of it, in season, stays for a while, goes back to it. That is Bilakshana, Mother Earth and a mint leaf or a mint herb. They are totally different. Mother Earth appears to be inanimate. From that inanimate, animate bodies come out. Mother Earth nurtures it. And then it dies and gets mixed up with Mother Earth. A second example. And what is the third example? A human body. Purushat Keshalomani. Body hair, head hair, nails. Keeps on growing. And you throw it away. It is not absorbed, it is thrown away. All these examples have been given. Now he gives you another example. What is it? A blazing, burning fire. All you do, you stoke the fire. 
or there is a blast of wind and you will find thousands and thousands of sparks coming out of it, flying out of it, stays for a while, then it exhausts itself. This is an example. Similarly, like a blazing fire, from that ultimate reality, this diverse world has come. And this diversity is based on, as I have told you many a times, and please kindly remember as much as you possibly can. as much as you possibly can. What is that? If you look at this world, there's infinite diversity. No two things are alike, but they are all independent existence. What is that independent existence which creates a diversity? Each one has a different name. Each one has a different form, shape and size. Each one has different qualities. Each one has a different utilitarian value in this society. When you take away those four, the fifth dimension is isness, existence. Is, is, is. Wherever my eyes fall, I am first aware of its existence. Then I look again, it is a chair. It is a steel frame chair. It is very comfortable, good. And it has a utilitarian value in the society. When all these four concepts disappear, what remains is eternal isness. And where is that isness to be found? Within yourself. That is your true original nature. This is para vidya vishaya. Opera vidya vishaya has been discussed, has been explained, and it is being told with what attitude you study opera vidya so that you are induced towards Paravitya. And this chapter starts with Paravitya. That from that eternal reality, that existence, the whole universe in its diversity has come out of it, goes back to it. Tasmat Jayate, Tasmin Liyate, Tajjalam Shadda Upashati. This is a formula. Tasma Jayati. It has come out of that reality. And ultimately, it goes back to that reality. Tasmin Liyate. Therefore, a knower of the self either who wants to know or has known already, he is Shanta, he is absolutely serene, poised, tranquil, there is no element of disturbance to possess and to know. He has no desire left for possessing, he has no desire left to knowing. He is absolutely poised, in the magnificence, in the excellence, in the majesty of his own true original being. You come out of it, you go back to it. A person 
meditates on that eternal reality. So before we go forward, dears, let us all, all uh, no, let me read the second shloka. Then we will start explaining. Divya hi amurta purusha sa bhajya bhyantara aja divya hi amurta purusha sa bhajya abhyantara aja a prana a mana shubhro aksharat parataha para this is the second shloka after the example being given of a blazing fire and innumerable sparks. Now let us see what does he say. Divya. Divya in English is effulgent, self-effulgent. What is the distinction? I find effulgence in moon. But that effulgence is a borrowed shine from the sun. Divya means self-effulgence like the sun. Sun is effulgent itself. You don't need a torchlight to see whether the sun is up or not. As soon as it's up, it is self-effulgent. Not only that, he lights up the whole cosmos during his stay from one horizon to the other horizon. Other horizon. Divya. That eternal entity which I have spoken of before, Paravidya Vishaya, is first is Divya. Self effulgent. Why this word effulgence is it being used? Because I say I know. I know you are sitting in my front. How does that knowledge generate? And it is all knowing, it is effulgent, there is no darkness, no hesitancy. You are sitting in my presence. I know. How do I know? I have told you many a times, please bear with me. I know because this body-mind mechanism is so made that my sense organs goes out of their orifices and measures you up, permeates you. And that figure, because of light and shade and color, that figure exactly reflects on my retina. That is the science of seeing, vision. And that retina, because of various colors, which is nothing else but intensity of light, stimulates your optic nerves. And those stimulated optic nerves carries that stimulation to that part of the brain whether the brain matter is so equipped that it interprets those stimulations and reflects the exact thing that the eyes have seen. And then rapidly goes round his store of memory. If I know you before, I say, here is so-and-so, 
sitting before me, I know. What has happened? That picture has been illuminated by that eternal reality. And it has been said and described as Satsarup, Chitsarup, Ananda Sarup, Atma, or Brahma. Satsarup means eternal existence. Chitsarup is eternal awareness. That awareness is translated as effulgence. Light makes it visible. Darkness doesn't allow your optic organs to function. So effulgence is awareness of your true original nature. Satsarupata and Chitsarupata, they are inseparable along with Ananda Sarupata. That is the true nature of that eternal reality. When you look at it cosmically, it is known as Brahman. When you look at it subjectively, it is known as Atman. Sat, Chit, Ananda, Swarup, Atma. That is what I am. I am effulgence pure and I light up whatever comes through my five sense organs. This is it. Now, dears, Divya here means self-effulgent, self-awareness. Amurtaha. It has no shape, no size, no form. It is, but it has no shape, it has no size, it has no form. Divya hi amurta hi binyogi. Have no doubt, this is an axiomatic truth that the wisdom of the divine is coming to you through the Upanishad literature. It is without any doubt, without any hesitation, you are he who resides in you the subject matter of I am, I continue to say I am. I am aware, I exist. Existence is satta and awareness of amness, awareness is chetana, effulgence. Ananda Swarupa is my nature, but I have put a filter so Satta and Chetana percolate through, but Ananda Swarupata cannot percolate. As for instance, as a piece of mica, you peed between blazing fire and yourself, the mica allows the luminosity of fire to percolate through, but mica does not allow the heat to percolate through. It's a great insulator. It's an example. I have something in me as a filter, as an insulator, where satta and chetana is percolating through, ananda Swarupata is not. Because of my endless desire of this world. But I'll come to that later on. Let us develop this idea, which is the basic concept of this Upanishad. The concept is, each one of us, honest, sincere, dedicated students of Upanishad, we say, dear teacher, you say, Brahman and Atman, in its own true original nature, is absolute. What is an absolute? Immutable, changeless, 
eternal infinite time space has no hold on it it is beyond immutable eternal infinite absolute that is what you say and at the same breath you say this phenomenal world has come out from it you are talking in circles dear teacher you are ambiguous you are playing with words how can the absolute be phenomenal this is my basic question before i go any further this part of the upanishad is give it will give you an answer to this question so be very careful and listen carefully let me proceed with the shloka the first line of the shloka says as far as is possible by by words the definition of brahman or atman divya amurta purusha sa bhajya abhyantara aja it does not go through a cycle of change being born being alive going through shadhava vikara the six modulations of life asti jayate bardhate viparinavate apakshyate lashyati i am i am born jayate bardhate from a newborn baby i become a baby a child a boy or a girl then i am adolescent then i am youth then i am adult mature adult adult growing mature in maturity in time old totter in old and then you go to your grave each thing which is produced in time has to go through these six variations asti jayate bardhate viparinavate apakshyate lashyati lashyati is disintegrated apakshyate is degeneration viparinavate is modulation not to the better side but the worse side old age bardhate from adult from adolescent to youth to adult and maturity of adult from 19 or 18 years of age to nearly 75 viparinavate you keep on modulating you are you are born you grow you modulate you slowly and slowly degenerate ultimately you disintegrate and you go all of us go through that phase and you say you are the absolute so i as a honest student with my intellect i cannot understand sir how can the absolute become the phenomena because you say phenomenal world goes through this six stages of modulation you say so and at the same time you say you are absolute i i don't understand you are talking in riddles in an enigma divya amurta purusha remember and underline this word i'll come back to it a little later sa bhajya abhyantara aja it is eternally existence 
it does not modulate or change. A prana, it does not have the life force which we have. A manaha, it does not have the mind and its activities which we have and experience. A prana, a mana, shubra. It is absolutely pure. Purity in our concept is white. The milky white snow is pure, unpolluted, undisturbed. Shubra. Aksharat parataha para. It is beyond the concept of is human immutability. We humans have a concept of immutability. It is beyond that concept of immutability. It is immutable. That is human concept of immutability. Immutability is a little qualified. We'll come to that. Now he says, word purusha. And that purusha is aksharat parataha paraha. It is beyond the immutable that you can conceive of. This is all riddle for us. So let us pay attention to the basic concepts of the Upanishad. Otherwise, we will say we have read the Upanishad, but we have not benefited from it. We have not profited ourselves from it. Therefore, dears, bear with me. I may take a little time, but the basic concept, the basic question, I would say, not the concept. The scriptures keep on saying this world is nothing else but the manifestation of Brahman. At the same breath you say Brahman is immutable. If it is immutable, how could it mutate into a world? As simple as that. To understand what it is really meaning, we have to dive deep within ourselves. The meaning lies in our various levels of experiencing. The solution lies in our own experiencing. Let me start. After a day's work, we go to sleep at night. Some night, I don't know why and how, I have no answer to it, I dream. And I dream of dreams, not of my choice or making. It happens. When it happens, I do not know the time I was asleep. In dream, what I will dream, I have no knowledge of it. No prior information of it. While I dream, it is absolutely real for me. I weep in my dream, I laugh in my dream, I run in my dream, I walk in my dream, I go to the United States to meet my cousins. And when I wake up, I find myself in my bed in Arlington, number two, Stuart Street, in my bedroom. Oh, it was a dream. And the awareness of the state of wakefulness proves to me 
that which I thought real while dreaming is unreal. Please don't take, take it as a story. I am creating the base of the very, very, I would say, impertinent question. How could the unman, uh, immutable, absolute Brahman be manifest in this universe? That is the question of each and every student of Vedanta. And I'll make my, I would say, effort as far as is possible for me to, to explain to you with what perspective, with what attitude you should approach this question to reach that answer. The answer is real because realized souls say so, incarnations say so. God has revealed himself to a human as that. How can you deny that? What is needed is we educate our attitude and perspective in such a manner that we see the harmonious, logical flow of arguments and ideas from that concept of the Absolute to the concept of manifested absolute in the form of this cosmos. This is the trick of the trade. You have to learn that, otherwise you'll be roaming, beating about the bush and roaming in circles, not to be your goal. So the first example I give you is the state of dream which is our experience. What is the end result of that experience? I do not know when the dream has started. Mark my words and make a note of it. I do not know when at what time my dream started. I have no freedom of choice what type of dream I will dream? It just happens beyond my control. These are the first two. And the third is most important. When I wake up and my wakeful state, Jagrata Avastha, my wakeful state proves to me absolutely without any hesitancy what I thought to be real in dream it appeared to be real at that time on my wakeful state I denounce it badhita I denounce it I destroy it that is unreal this is real my wakeful state is real Comparison between your dream and your wakeful state. And who is the experiencer? You. I am the experiencer of the dream and of my day-to-day -day wakeful life. There's another distinction, dear. That is, my wakeful life is like a TV serial. I go to sleep, that is the end of one of the serials. I dream, the serial is broken. I wake up and I immediately connect with my previous serial. And another serial goes, my wakeful state. I have no control on my dream, but my wakeful state from the day I was aware enough till today, there's a sequence going through. There's no sequence in dream. Tonight's dream 
does not start from when it ended tonight, it starts from tomorrow night. Please observe these ideas very carefully. This will clarify your concept. How could the absolute, with what attribute, with what perspective, with what way of understanding, I can rationally convince myself, yes, that absolute, rationally is justified to say, has become the manifest world, has become the phenomenal world. This is between your sapnavastha, the state of dream, and state of awareness, wakefulness. Now, there's another state you go through in your life, another experience, dreamless sleep, shushupti. Remember these words, dreamless sleep, shushupti. What is that, dear? Let us try to describe what dreamless sleep is. I work very hard the whole day. And for a few days, I was defaulting in my sleep. And I can't carry on anymore. I hit my pillow and I go to And the sleep is so deep. There is no dream whatsoever. Dreamless sleep. Each one of us has experienced it. And when I wake up, I take my time to think, where am I? What time of day or night is it? Is it afternoon or it is morning? Is it evening or it is morning? Let me see my watch. Let me see the sky. The sleep is so deep, you have lost sense of time, you have lost sense of space, you have lost sense of every diversity that you can think of. But what is your first recollection, first information? Sukha Mahamasapsam Kinchit Navedisham. I have slept like a log and I knew nothing. You are remembering your experience of the dreamless sleep when you wake away by saying, when you wake up by saying, Oh, what a beautiful sleep I had. The whole world did not exist for me. Kinchitna Vedisham. There was no diversity whatsoever. I was totally enveloped, covered up with ignorance, darkness, not knowing everything. The only awareness was I slept, that memory comes to me of that experience. I was there still. In dream, in dream sleep, I am active. My ego is active. And all that I see in my day-to-day -day life, in a subtle form, they are in my dream. The world in a subtle form, is in my dream. But in dreamless sleep, nothing exists. I was enveloped in ignorance, darkness. And as far as Bhavaharik Bhitta is concerned, Jagrat Avastha is concerned, I don't need to tell you anything. You know what it is. Dream sleep, 
sleep with dream, sleep without dream, and wakeful state. And the fourth state, known as the sublime, the, uh, what do you say, sublime, the topmost, beyond which there is nothing, Turiya Avastha, where a human being identifies his amnes with the cosmic amnes. Nirvikalpa Samadhi. We go through these four stages, three stages for ordinary human and for a sadhaka who has tried his best with the, his own hard work, teaching of his guru and ultimately the compassionate blessings of God. He reaches first Savikalpa Samadhi, Akshara Brahma and Akshara Parata Para Nirbun Nirakar Nirvikalpa Brahma. These are the four stages of awareness that is available to a human. The Upanishad here is speaking about that in a language that was very much readily understandable in those days. We have moved thousands of years away from it. Those standard thinking, those value system, those ideas have become obsolete, almost lost. That is why this question arises. What the Upanishad teaches you is that here you have no control on your sleep with a dream. You have no control of sleep without dream. With your ego, you control your day-to-day -day life, wakeful life. When you are not sleeping, you are awake. By diligent cultivation of the faculties, discipline, devotion, dedication, determination, discipline. These are all adjectives to discipline. Devotion, dedication, determination. Determ and then disciplining yourself. You can identify yourself as a human with your true original nature the Parama Atman. Parama Atma. This Jivatma merges with Paramatma as a river merges with ocean. This is the secret there. At that stage, Ishwara doesn't exist. In Aksharat Parata Para, is Nirgun Nirakar Nirvikalpa Brahma, which is Paramatma, which is Jivatma, and Paratmatma are the same. A river flowing into the ocean. Jivatma merges with Paramatma irre irretrievably, irreversibly. It cannot be retrieved, it cannot be brought back forever. From that stage there, it is Aksharat Parataha Para. When you reach there, there is nothing to describe. It only happens to a person who reaches there and experiences there. Abhang Monasha Gocharam Bhoje Pran, Bhoje Jaan. Swamiji in his description and a small sonnet 
known as Samadhi. He explains what happens. At that time, Bhakya, Mana, Buddhi, Ahankara, nothing remains. All these so-called adjuncts have been thrown away. The pure self merges with the absent. When you come back again, if God wills it, if you come back, it is His design. You have no desire left. He wants you to come back to make use of you to tease the society. That is what happens to you. So dear, what happens at that time when you come back, you see the name, you see the form, you see the qualities, you see the utilitarian value. They become secondary. Primary is, I am everywhere. Deha abhimane galite. When my body consciousness has dissolved, vigyate paramatmani. When I have known my true original nature, Yatra Yatra Mano Jati, wherever, wherever my mind may roam about. Tatra Tatra, then and there, then and there, Param Padam Drishyate, I only see my true nature. This is what happens to a person who comes back from Nirvikalpasa. The second chapter, dear, and the first chapter of the second Mundaka, which we have started, he will very poetically describe this whole cosmos with his oceans, with his, with his ocean, with his, oh, I'm sorry, with his ocean, with his rivers, with his hills and dales and forests and mountains, snows and deserts, everything has come out of it. They're all apparently real. The reality behind is the absolute existence, aksharat parataha par. So when we translate it to English, dear, there's a little difficulty and it becomes ambiguous occasionally. However, you may try to be precise and correct. Then to use one Sanskrit word, you have to use a paragraph of description. So it is better we students of Upanishad, we remember those catchwords in English. Shapnavastha, avastha means state. Shrapna means dream, dream state. Shushupti avastha, dreamless state. Jagrata avastha, the state of wakefulness. And Turiya avastha, the sublime beyond Sabikalpa Samadhi. That's it. So let us stop here, dear. We will pay due attention to this before we go ahead. And I kept this for revision because the first day you would not have understood. Now you are at home with these ideas. So these subtle ideas will be very easily absorbable by you. Thank you, dear. Thank you again till we meet. God bless us all. Thank you.